And so now uh, we'll take questions for Jessica or for Dan. Um, if you have a question, please uh, identify yourself, and there's a microphone up there, so wait till you get the mic to uh, ask a question. Hi, I'm, I'm from the Washington Post. I have a technical eyes glazed over question for Mr. Cadman and then just a general question for any of you. Um, you talked a lot about this sort of uh, moving around the numbers from Border Patrol to ICE in the, on the border area. Are you saying that they're doing a double count or simply that they're just moving the numbers from one to another? You're not saying they're counting a Border Patrol and then um, the ICE um, uh, m moments in detention, uh, de detention as two, two people. You're not no, they're not. They're, they're splitting the apprehension and the removal. They are not counting the removal twice. Okay. They are shifting that removal, and in order to do that, it seems to me, they've actually tinkered with the, with the alien transportation and detention system to give it a, a, a facially legitimate cover by ensuring that those aliens get put into ICE detention for a minimal amount of time. You, you put them into an ICE detention center long enough to kind of bless them with you're now an ICE removal, you're not a border patrol removal, even if they get put back on a border patrol bus and moved Right, across. but I guess my question is, I mean, aside from the fact that there's this sort of interior, internal fight going on, how, how does that affect the overall picture? I didn't quite understand that. That's actually a, a very good question and one that I tried to um, identify in going through these numbers because each agency keeps its own separate numbers um, and some of them are in the report. There's a document that talks about Border Patrol apprehensions by case disposition. And that shows how each border patrol, uh, each case of the border tr patrol was resolved. Many of them are removals. Those removals were carried out by ICE. ICE is also reporting removals according to which agency made the referral. So if you're looking at these um, sets of information separately, the same cases are counted in both different sets. What I was told by sources is that the way the uh, case tracking system works is that when the individual is apprehended by Border Patrol, goes into the ICE service processing center, the detention facility, they're bussed over, let's say they were apprehended in Arizona, they're bussed over to um, the El Paso sector and removed. When that removal, uh, th that the system automatically updates the original record for both ICE and the B Border Patrol to, you know, put a hash mark or whatever it does, you know, in, in, in the computer system to add another removal to both of those systems, both Border Patrol and ICE. And I was also told that if the individual was held in two different ICE facilities, that would become two cases for ICE. And it would, could be two cases for the Border Patrol, too, if they were apprehended in one sector and removed in another. The, way this, the pro name for this program is called the Alien Transfer and Exit Program. And so there were lots of different sectors involved and different detention centers and field offices. And the question I had was, when all these numbers get funneled into the DHS Office of Immigration Statistics, which produces an annual number for all removals and all returns, are these duplicates removed? Um, I was never able to get an answer. It was suggested to me that they're not. I don't know that for sure, but looking at all the different numbers I saw, I don't think they do get the duplicates removed as you can do with your own Access or Excel program because they all have case identifiers. They're all fingerprinted. They could, um, but I think that would be a very good question to ask them to resolve that ambiguity. Okay. Go ahead. If, sorry, I forget that this is here. If one of the imports of your question is what does it matter, it matters because it masks the fact that ICE isn't nearly as productive as you would think. People have a right to know what their agency, you know, statistics are, whether the agency is in fact 
giving value for dollar. They've, they've gotten a lot of resources in recent years and a lot, of, a lot of capital resources, a lot of detention beds, and a lot of officers. And if they're masking those numbers, how can you possibly know whether they're effective or whether, in fact, they've started to step away from their, their primary mission? One of the other figures that I believe is in Jessica's report that I find deeply disturbing is, if you look, there is a figure called encounters. There are well over 700,000 encounters. An encounter is an officer physically making contact with an alien who is illegally in the United States. But if you look at the removals, you have to ask yourself at the removals, which are, uh, what, half of that, less than half? Well, 2013, it's uh, for ICE ERO, it's, uh, it's about hundred less than 170,000. What happens 700, after- 700,000 encounters. What's happening after that ICE officer encounters the alien? Is he just walking away because of you know, the guidelines for deferred action childhood arrivals, for prosecutorial discretion, for don't lay detainers on these individuals um, who have been booked into a, a county jail? How could, how could officers be encountering 700 plus thousand illegal aliens and only result in a workload of about half that. There is something seriously wrong with that statistic. I, and I, I should I just, have... I'm sorry. Um, I don't mean to suggest that I think the Department of Homeland Security created the Alien Transfer and Exit Program in order to um, you know, be able to pump ICE's numbers, but I think that the existence of that program and the way those cases are tracked has simply enabled them to hide the poor performance of ICE in interior enforcement behind the Border Patrol cases that were being taken over by the agency. I just, I did Go have ahead. one broad Sorry. question that I wanted to ask whoever maybe Mark um, would like to answer. Um, is it your position um, as an organization that the great majority of illegal aliens now in this country could and should and can be deported? We don't have a specific position on that, but uh, I mean, there's no question that we could be deporting significantly more people than we're deporting now. I mean, it seems to me beyond that, it's not an issue of what one's position is. But yes, of course, more people uh, could be and should be deported than are deported now. There's also the impact that strong enforcement across the spectrum has on, on aliens deciding whether to cross to begin with or in deciding whether or not they want to make their future back in their home country if they find that it becomes difficult and near impossible to obtain gainful employment using fraudulent identification or in any way that they can, defeating um, the verification systems, whether it's um, by duping the employer or quite frequently with a wink and a nod from the employer who suspects the identification presented is bad, but you know is perfectly willing to take it at face value. So it, I think sometimes it's not just a question of the government physically putting their hands and cuffs on aliens. The tenor of enforcement and the tenor of an agency and a an government and an administration's um, willingness to take on enforcement has a great impact on decisions that aliens make because they're rational people just like all the rest of us. They make judgments about what is likely to make their lives easier or harder. And if they think they can stay here and, and work profitably for a long time and, and maybe even have an encounter with an immigration officer who walks away from them, why wouldn't they stay? You have another question here? Julie? Or, oh, okay, yeah, go ahead, and then you, sir. I was wondering, in, in, the, in the transferring of aliens from one place to another, if, if you're able to figure out how many resources are devoted to that, to basically unnecessary transfers. No, that's a good question. Um, the program, my understanding is that the, the program has been studied 
within DHS, although I have not seen any public reports on the cost effectiveness of it or its effectiveness in deterring multiple crossings. I haven't seen it. They may have done it. My, I was told that officially the alien trans transfer exit program has been discontinued, although it could be continuing under another name or, you know, I don't know. But there is a rationale. I mean, there is an enforcement rationale for that kind of program. In other words, the point being you return illegal immigrants, you know, if you caught them near, you know, they came from Tijuana and then you return them to Nogales, that they don't, that the smuggling ring they were involved with is no longer there. There's a rationale. Maybe a good idea, may not. It may be cost effective, it may not. But I mean, it's not purely um, make work. There actually is kind of a point to that sort of thing. In theory. In theory. In works. theory, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. Thank you. Uh, Martin Johnson. I'm a law enforcement training uh, person. Um, two quick things for Mr. Cadman. Did I understand correctly? a statistic that 40% of people illegally in the United States now entered legally? Or did I misunderstand that? No, you didn't misunderstand that. Okay, so they'd be visa overstays or just people who decided, I don't feel like going anywhere. Uh, yeah, they came for a, and were, were admitted to the United States for a finite period of time, whether as tourists or as non-immigrant students or, you know, any of the, or visa waiver tourists, people who, who come as tourists, but they're from countries where a visa isn't necessary, but that's a technicality. The point is, they were admitted into, into the United States for a finite period of time um, to visit or to attend school, not to, not to gain jobs, and they just decide, I'm not going home, I'm gonna get a job, I'm gonna stay, and I'm going to melt into society, and they do. Yeah, so technically, usually referred to as a legal non-immigrant. Correct? If, uh, unless I'm missing my terminology. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't. So those people would be referred to originally as legal non-immigrants. Yes. So a person non-permanent. And Correct. If, I, if I may, a second one. Any stats on uh, uh, illegal presence, uh, presence of illegal aliens or entry of illegal aliens from countries which are state sponsors of terrorism involved in this study? Or if anything you'd like to comment? Well... As far as within the overstate population, um, we don't know because um, the Department of Homeland Security has not released the results of analyses that they've done internally to know which countries the overstayers came from. Um, we simply, because of the lack of an entry exit system, don't have that information. And what little they do know, they haven't released. Jessica doesn't deal with it in the report. I mean, I, I don't want to interrupt right. you, Dan, but I mean, it's, that's not part of what's in the report, but go ahead. There, there are Border Patrol um, statistics available on apprehensions by country of citizenship. I think it's fair to say that if you can think of any country that um, whose citizens or nationals come to the United States, some portion of them stay, and they stay illegally. And a surprising number of countries that, whose interests don't always align well with ours um, send their citizens to the United States for a variety of reasons. It's not unreasonable at all to say that some numbers of countries which may be designated as state sponsors of terror have citizens residing in the United States illegally. It would, it would be impossible for that not to be the case. I had actually a kind of a quick question. Um, ICE has all these extra resources. They're deporting dramatically fewer people. So what are they doing? What is ICE doing? I mean, you see press releases sometimes on, they're, you know, counterfeit contact lens dealers, yes. that kind of thing. So I was just wondering what kind of things ICE is doing. Returning stolen antiquities. Right. Um, tracking down child porn purveyors. Uh, enforcing the Lacey Act which prevents the importation of plants and other things that have been illegally obtained. Uh, they put out their top 10 list last week of laws you didn't know ICE enforce. I expected to see the Immigration and Nationality Act as number one. <laughs> I, 
But <laughs> I, I don't think any of us suggest that that you know that um, ICE's investigative efforts should not involve certain kinds of contraband that seriously and adversely affect the public health and safety. But when you find that an entire division of special agents is now only doing 4% of the immigration work, that is stunning to me, it's stunning. When they're responsible for worksite enforcement and transnational gang operations and all kinds of alien smuggling gets invested, investigated much less frequently now than it used to be when the Border Patrol did it. And, and alien smuggling is not um, a victimless crime. Many of the aliens who are smuggled into the United States are held in near chattel conditions or um, they are held um, under extortionate uh, circumstances uh, until their friends or relatives in the United States pony up another five or $10,000 um, they are not well treated. Um, many of them are imported to the United States um, to work in sweatshops or in brothels. And yet HSI seems to be turning um, a blind eye to a lot of that kind of enforcement. Any other questions? Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So if I could just, because I do think it is very complicated, I want to make sure I understand. Essentially, if I had to kind of simplify it, and maybe when you simplify, you lose stuff, but essentially, it's this reclassification of things that probably are more aptly described as apprehensions, things that the Border Patrol does near or at the border, as interior enforcement is what has allowed them to say that deportations, which most of us think of as interior enforcement, is at a record level. But when you take out this border patrol activity that would normally be seen as border patrol activity, there really has been a decline in enforcement. Is that a fair way of summing it up? Yes, that, that is a fair way of summing it up. That without the additional um, cases from the border, ICE is, uh, or overall deportation numbers would have declined. And in fact, what we now know is overall numbers of deportations for 2013 have declined even, even with, with some okay. unknown number of Border Patrol cases. Okay. So now, so then the final... It sounds right, and if you're interested in interior enforcement, it's clear that activity has declined quite substantially over the last three years. So the question then is, is it intentional to falsely create the idea of very robust interior enforcement, or is it just kind of a bureaucratic thing that developed and they're like, yeah, well, we can say it, uh, you know, <laughs> if anyone catches this. Um, in other words, is it, how conscious is it, do you think? Do you think they're, they're being intentionally deceptive? If, if you get called on it, as John Morton was, wouldn't you think you'd take a step back and ask yourself whether the way you're going about this deserves a second look? Wouldn't you want the public to know exactly um, how productive you are without having to borrow or adopt someone else's work? I mean, I think the answer to that is, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, as Queen Elizabeth I once said, I have no window on men's souls. So nobody at the White House calls me up and says, you know, this is really what we're planning. On the other hand, um, if you follow the debate, everybody who was a spokesman for the pro-comprehensive side, without exception, points to the supposed record level of deportation. Those are the words they use. I mean, it's almost like bees in a hive, all saying the same thing. Record level of deportations. It's a mantra. And there's a reason. It's, uh, it ha there has to be a reason for that. They figured out this is the thing they can do in order to create this talking point. The point of which, as Dan had pointed out, and as the congressman had pointed out, is to be able to say, look, we have this record level of deportations. You can trust us with to enforce the law tomorrow uh, on Tuesday if you give us the amnesty hamburger today. I mean, that's what it amounts to. And so I have to say I am, you know, without anyone telling me this, Cecilia Munoz does not consult me, but I can say that I feel 100% certain this is 
intentional. I'm, I don't want to speak for Dan or Jessica, but I have absolutely no doubt that it's intentional. I think at some point it maybe doesn't even matter if it's wrong and someone calls you on it and, and you stupidly did it, shouldn't you take a step back? It becomes intentional at that point, if you will. Or release the breakdown so that people can see what the real numbers are and make their own judgment as to whether um, that should be considered you know, deportations or you know, if, if, you know, just give people the information to decide for themselves you know, what the state of immigration enforcement is. There's a question in the back. Um, hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Claudia. Uh, thank you for the report. Um, my question would come in terms of what we know as mixed status families, um, because the reality is that this enforcement is very real um, in terms of uh, family. So what are your thoughts in terms of um, deportations, which whether they're very high or low, uh, to your perspective, uh, deportations um, in families where you do have U.S. citizen children or U.S. citizen siblings. Um, I'm part of the 40% that you've spoken about. Um, I came uh, here with my family, actually not by choice, um, neither my parents or myself. Um, so I guess uh, I'm not sure what you would like to do with a person like myself, um, but um, I actually, uh, while I was here visiting, um, my sister became very ill. Uh, my parents are both um, former engineers. My dad worked for IBM in Central America for many years. Um, he works here, um, tries to at least. Um, but, um, but my sister's case, it was an illness, right? She, uh, she was diagnosed with leukemia, which is a, a very real issue. Uh, but I have U.S. citizen siblings. I have U.S. citizen friends, and I have U.S. citizen family. Um, and there hasn't been a pathway uh, for me in the system. And um, I am open to conversations on enforcement. In fact, that is most of the work that I do um, was working on local enforcement uh, for the Silicon Valley where I am um, from or I've lived for the past eight years. Uh, so I guess my question for you um, is a very honest question. Um, what would you want to do uh, with families that are in mixed statuses? Because I think that's a problem that's really hurt in America. Thank you. I mean, anybody want to take it? Um, I think families have to make those choices. Um, I've lived overseas as well as a, as a kid in high school. My parents came back to the United States. I went with my family, and they wouldn't have had it any other way. Um, there's no rule that U.S. citizens have to live in the United States, and you know those are the decisions we should not change our policies to overcome what may turn out to be mistaken choices that people make. Uh, so, so this would be the case of, for I liked the country I lived in. I would have loved to have stayed longer, but my parents brought me back with them. So, so that was the choice. Right. Um, my parents. Well, not for me. I went with my parents. Uh, you know. But I, well, go, go ahead, Dan, I, and then we're going to take another question. I, I think one of the I, I guess I have several answers for you all, all at the same time. And the first is um, one of the problems that I perceive of and the way the administration has been um, has overused, perhaps abused, prosecutorial discretion um, and deferred action is that when you really have a meritorious case, you talked about leukemia, that ceases to have as much meaning because that was a category that used to be used for cases of people facing life-threatening disease and it not only was for the, used for those people but it was used for the nuclear family that needed to be around those people. That's no longer the case. Situations such as yours get lost in the dross of tens of thousands of people who are all kind of blessed with prosecutorial discretion or, or deferred action. So it, it loses its meaning for people in seriously um, uh, distraught situations. 
That's one answer. The second answer is, is perhaps a little tough, but it's this. What does your country of birth do with people who overstay there? I assume they have immigration laws, and I assume that they enforce them. Mexico enforces its immigration laws, particularly against Salvadorans and Guatemalans, and, and often pretty harshly. There are not always quick, clean answers for the questions that you've posed, but there is certainly a uniformity that every country in the world exhibits its self-interest in its immigration laws, and they try and find a way to balance the humane with the need and the understanding that if at some point you lose control, there is no immigration policy anymore. And that leads me to my third answer, and that is, it is a disservice to the children of people like your parents, whether they are citizens or illegal aliens or anything in between, if the authorities who are charged with doing enforcement walk away from it or are so lax that families are allowed to develop so long that they develop these intertwining relationships with the country. It is in some ways, putting aside leukemia, it is in some ways more humane to quickly and effectively send people back home and require them to make their lives in the country that they came from, assuming that they are not legitimate asylees or refugees, than it is to allow them to grow roots in a country where they're in limbo forever. Uh, last question was uh, Pamela. Uh, Oh, here, yeah. Okay, that's, that, we're taking another question. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, this is for, uh, for Jessica. You mentioned something really interesting. I, if I'm mistaken, the number, just change it. I think you said that there are more than 800,000 people with final orders of deportation who are still in the country. My, I'm sorry, two questions. One, why is that the case? Why aren't they being deported? Is it because they can't be found? Or what are the reasons? That also goes to the question, what is ICE doing? And then number two, if you have this large population that's potentially uh, ready to be deported, don't you think that an administration that was trying to beef up its deportation numbers would deport them? Thank you. OK. Um, there are a couple reasons why people may still be here after they've received a final order of deportation. One reason that applies to a small number of people, and this is discussed in the report, um, is because their home country will not accept them back. There are either slow walks, travel documents, or um, is dysfunctional, or you know we don't have a repatriation treaty. Uh, and they essentially cannot be removed for that reason. That's a very small set you know, of, of, of the, the 800 some thousand. Um, the other reason is because no, they are still living here because they are able to. Um, they are not priorities for removal necessarily. They, they don't find themselves in situations where they come to the attention of ICE. And if they do, under current policies, they do not, be, they don't fall, because they, you know, for most of them have not committed other crimes are not considered a priority, and, and ICE simply lets them go. Um, why ICE doesn't go after them to boost their numbers? Under, uh, well, for many years, there was a concerted effort to reduce the size of this population, which some call the absconders. ICE started up fugitive operations teams in, I think, probably every field office. Um, with a new administration, they changed their priorities and decided that the only people who would be apprehended by those fugitive teams were people who had committed other serious crimes. So they've simply dropped off the high priority part of the docket. Yeah. And you know, there, by the time someone reaches a post-final order circumstance, a tremendous amount of time and energy and money has been spent to put them in, into that circumstance. And without the will and the, and the intent to do something, I have, to, I have to believe that the immigration judges are scratching their heads asking themselves, 
what are we doing and why are we doing it? We're, we're just churning out these orders of removal that ICE doesn't seem to care about. Um, it becomes a, a kind of theater of the absurd that, um, again, if it was the criminal justice system, no one would put up with that, nobody. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, theater of the absurd is a good note to end on because that's much of what our immigration system really is. Um, I think our uh, speakers are here to be accosted afterwards if you'd like, but I want to respect people's time so they can get out. Thank you very much. And uh, the report is outside, is also going to be online very shortly, and the uh, video of the event will also be online at some point probably next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>